All right, if I can get uh, everyone to, uh, to convene. So good morning and uh, welcome. Uh, for those of you who I don't know, my name is Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. Uh, welcome. So this is uh, one of our regular symposia where we convene experts around issues that we think are important for us as a school and uh, for the world. We actually look forward eagerly to events like this on our calendar because we think that they help sharpen our thinking and form our ideas. So thank you all. Thank you all for being here and being a part of this conversation. Today's event uh, comes from several years of conversations, principally with Professor Rich Sates, about how departments of community health science can best contribute to the enterprise of creating healthy populations. As Professor Sates will tell you shortly, health is largely not determined at the level of individuals. It's really a result of our broader context, with our community playing a key role in determining whether we get sick or whether we stay well. Today, you're going to hear from a number of people who are experts in this, who are going to talk about the ways our communities shape our health and how we may, in turn, shape our community to make it more conducive to our well-being. My hope is that today, these discussions will help guide us in thinking about how the academic enterprise can grapple with this topic and how community health science and related fields specifically can best realize their promise in guiding our scholarship in this area forward. Before we begin, I just want to take a moment to thank three people, sort of three groups, who've made work today possible. Well, first, we have the um, uh, staff in the Community Health Sciences Department with Administrative Coordinator Megan Westbrook, our events um, group um, with um, events manager Lindsay um, Morachver, our dean's office team led by Catherine Atman, and our communication team led by Cara Peterson. So thank you, all of you. I'm now very pleased to introduce Professor Rich Sates. Uh, Professor Sates is a primary care physician, addiction medicine specialist, and chair of our Community Health Science Department, and he's very much the intellectual architect of today's program. Rich. Thank you very much, Sandro. Good morning, thank you all for being here. We have many attending from far and near, despite some of the storms and, and fires in the West and all. Uh, we've had many folks show up, uh, both from our local neighborhoods as well as uh, from institutions across the country. Thanks to students, faculty, staff, alumni, uh, and our guests who are here uh, from academia, industry, nonprofits, uh, and government organizations. The purpose of today's symposium is to begin to define an academic field, the field of community health sciences, which I might refer to as CHS as the day goes on to make it shorter. We hope to follow this up with future events more focused on the actual doing of community health sciences once it's a bit clearer that it's a field. Um, today we'll hear two bigger picture talks to help stimulate our thinking and panels that include brief examples of cutting edge research followed by discussions facilitated and led by leaders in their respective fields. At the end of the day, I'll facilitate a discussion in which we synthesize our ideas about how and whether to define this field and consider next steps. Those next steps will certainly need to go beyond defining the field and beyond the academy. So the landscape of community health sciences defining the field. I mean, I, I do think that CHS, or Community Health Sciences, is a distinct field. Uh, what defines it may be its focus, looking through a community lens. Uh, I also wonder at the same time whether that is enough to define it, but it does seem to have some prominent features. Uh, and our faculty actually got together the other day, uh, and they've been thinking about this for years, even before I became chair, because uh, our department was the result of a merger of two departments, the maternal, maternal and child health and social and behavioral sciences. And when they came together, they needed a new name. And so the faculty came up with this name. And when we met, um, again, we've discussed this before, but when we met last week uh, to talk about it again, uh, these prominent features rose to the surface. So at least four areas, uh, I think, that feature prominently in community health sciences. One is a focus on community and social context. The second is interdisciplinary work that integrates many scientific fields. For example, sociology, psychology, epidemiology, and then draws on quantitative and qualitative information sources, and then goes beyond observation to understand the implications of findings, challenge the findings, and then intervene or apply them. 
Community Health Sciences prominently features collaboration, engagement, and partnership with community, and advocacy to improve health uh, and health equity. Now, I thank Trish Elliott, one of our faculty members in Community Health Sciences, for suggesting that to consider what Community Health Sciences is and whether it matters, one could look at what public health would look like without it. Actually, the slide's appro fairly appropriate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a hint. Um, so a thought experiment. You all know the story of John Snow and the Broad, or now Broadwick Street, pump. He discovered that the pump handle was a risk factor for as yet to be identified that disease of cholera. But had he stopped there, the epidemic would not have ended because many didn't believe his findings. Community engagement, in part with a re respected community leader, a reverend, led to doing something about that pump handle. That was the intervention part. So there's observation, uh, and the, the discovery was not enough to make something happen. And that's what's reflected in these uh, images. Another well-known example and slightly sadder story, uh, for those of you who recognize this picture, this is Ignaz Semmelweis, who observed that more women cared for by doctors versus midwives died of purpural or childbed fever. Uh, he even found that hand washing with chlorinated solution reduced the risk. But his findings weren't accepted by the relevant community. The relevant community was doctors in that case until after his death. Discovery and new knowledge were not enough. In fact, the Semmelweis effect or the Semmelweis reflex now refers to the tendency to reject new evidence or knowledge because it contradicts established norms or beliefs. Community Health Sciences, CHS, helps us understand how to work in these frameworks to implement effective interventions to improve health. So what's so important for health about community? Um, even the most individual determinants of health that one can imagine, like single gene mutations, a disease like sickle cell anemia, uh, don't determine health status alone, as you all know. Prognosis and severity, the experience of illness, and health are all determined by a complex mix of social factors in a community context, health behaviors, and systems in society, ideas that are well summarized by the social ecological model. One of our faculty actually produced mugs, coffee mugs, with these, although I have yet to get mine. I'm not pointing you out right now, but I would like to get a mug with this on it. Um, health is a product of community, and CHS tries to help sort that out. Now, what about the academy? So what is the academy, the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, or ASPPH, and the Council on Education for Public Health, or CEPH, C -E -P -H, have to say about this? Well, as you may know, although there are well-defined foundational sciences of public health, like epidemiology and biostatistics, for teaching, schools are moving away from teaching scientific disciplines per se and towards teaching skills and competencies. As such, they require students learn about, for example, the health characteristics of populations within a shared geographic area, community. Um, they want us to look, to, to have students have the competency to look through a framework of community structure. They specify learning about the social determinants of health and health promotion. They don't exactly specify that we should have a science called community health sciences or CHS or departments um, called that, but they certainly require competence in what I think that frame uh, includes. Now, in addition to those sciences that comprise CHS and the broader competencies that are espoused by that academy, I also make the observation that in CHS we tend to address certain topic areas that we view through a community lens. We'll address some of these today, but by no means all. I did have a chair who responded to the invitation to this symposium by noticing that some of the fields that his faculty were studying were not listed as topics that we were gonna cover today. And that's, that's a fair criticism or, or observation that, um, that we do cover many different topic areas, although the science thread seems to be the same and, and some of those prominent features that I talked about earlier um, seem to be there. So we're going to cover um, uh, issues of partnership to equity versus equality, prevention versus cure, alcohol and other drug use and addiction, violence and maternal and child health. So these remarks were meant to get us all thinking about whether CHS exists. If it exists, how we should define it. If we can define it, whether it matters. I've suggested it does matter 
that it should exist, and that we probably can define it. Because it's only in defining it that we can be at that table doing it. And you have to be at the table if you're going to get things done. Trish Elliott, sorry Trish, again, the same faculty member who made me imagine a world without CHS put it well last week. She said, CHS puts the do in our school's common purpose, which is to think, teach, and do for the health of all. So thanks, Trish, for that observation. Uh, a couple, just a couple of things as we transition. Hashtag BUSPH Symposia for those of you <laughs> tweeting. I've checked, and many of you do not have Twitter accounts. Uh, <laughs> but those of you who do uh, could be doing some live tweeting that you'll see on the screens on the side. Uh, and just to remind you of the structure of the day, we have um, two plenary sessions and uh, one just following my remarks now, and then one uh, in, in, in the middle of the day, end of the morning, and then three panels, and on those panels, there'll be uh, presentations of 10 minutes each with five minutes of questions uh, following each one, followed by a discussion of all three uh, that will take uh, up to 30 minutes. The first one maybe even a, just a bit longer uh, for reasons that I'll explain later. Then there'll be lunch at 12.15. By the end of the day, I will try to synthesize what we've all learned together uh, by taking your thoughts and, and typing them up um, as, as we speak and as you speak and, and discuss what you think you've heard and, and where you think we should go next. So without any further delay, let's get on to our first uh, plenary session. Academic community collaborations to reduce uh, inequalities, lessons from community community-based participatory research, and this will be done by Nina Wallerstein. Uh, Nina, you can switch to the next slide, yeah. Nina is director of the Center for Participatory Research and professor of public health, College of Population Health at the University of New Mexico, and she's been developing community-based participatory research, or CBPR, and empowerment interventions for over 30 years. Among over 140 publications are a 2017 book, Community-Based Participatory Research for Health, Advancing Social and Health Equity in its third edition. In 2016, she received the inaugural Community Engaged Research Lecture Award from the University of New Mexico, Office of the Vice President for Research. She's worked in North American and Latin American contexts in family, youth, and women's health intervention research, participatory evaluation of healthy municipalities, and with tribal partners to support culturally centered research in New Mexico and in the U.S. She's currently co-PI of a NIDA-funded intergenerational family prevention program with children, parents, and elders in three Southwest tribes. To improve the science of CBPR and reduce health inequities, she's principal investigator of NINR-funded uh, study to uh, research best partnering practices. She's collaboratively produced with Latin American colleagues a Train the Trainer Empowerment, Participatory Research, and Health Promotion Curriculum, initially sponsored by PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. She co-sponsors an annual summer institute for CBPR for Health uh, at the University of New Mexico. Professor Wallerstein, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Galea, Dr. Seitz, uh, all my wonderful colleagues who are here today. I am really thrilled to be presenting on um, CBPR, my love and passion in my life, and try to make it um, applicable to the context of the Community Health Sciences um, program. I want to actually thank Rich for setting the stage. I took his writing of the same issues that he promoted here at the beginning. Um, and I will be focusing on the collaborating and engaging with community aspects of this panorama that you presented just very briefly but succinctly this morning, so thank you. Um, so the definition of community engagement we all know, but it's just the process of working collaboratively together with groups of people who share similar interests, et cetera, and hopefully there are goals of building trust. I tried to take this, this comes from the principles of community engagement from the Centers for, uh, at CTSA's Centers for Translational Science Awards that um, this is a re-second re edition of a previous CDC publication. And within it is a continuum of community engagement. And you can see outreach through shared leadership. To me, even though I love my CTSC colleagues, um, unfortunately, this does not re represent community engagement to me, because to me, outreach should not even be there. 
That is not engagement to me, that is unidirectional, us providing education to communities. And on the other side of shared leadership, I look to what I consider to be even a very important addition, which is community-led and community-driven um, interventions and research in general, whether there are multiple kinds of research. So for me, CBPR, I take the Kellogg very commonly used definition of CBPR, collaborative, building on strengths, equitable, research of importance to the community. And in our new book that we have is coming out in fall, thank you very much, um, it will be at, out at APHA at, at the booth there. Um, we're trying to look at not just research large NIH endeavors, but any collaborative effort that is using data and research to drive its initiative and to build on the strengths of the community. And this is a lot for my colleagues in Latin America who may not be doing these kind of <laughs> intensive multi-year research projects but are doing very important interventions and doing strong evaluation of those interventions or other type of smaller studies. They are saying that any use of data done collaboratively should have the same principles underlying it using multi-level strategies to improve health and social equity. So for me, um, in New Mexico, we've created this very simple little diagram. Many of us do research on communities. We define a target. We look at the demographics, the geographic region. Others of us do research in community settings, whether it's in a jail, in a hospital, in a school. The question is, how does it change if it's research with community partners? And there is a big difference from on in and with. So it's a question to all of us. Not all of us can be doing projects at a time that is always with, but when we are doing it with, there's a set of principles. This from um, colleagues Balzac and Rachel morello Frosch really represents kind of the increase or starting from what the unfortunate term helicopter science or in um, often in you know rural settings you'd bring a helicopter in, drag out the data and leave versus, or in urban settings drive by research where you just grow, take it and go to, um, moving to an advanced or a much larger realm of community engagement where CBPR exists, where people become partners in all aspects of the research. And what I want to talk about today is some lessons that I've learned over these many years of how I think about CBPR and its applicability to the community health sciences field. So my first lesson is to start from who I am. I can't pretend to be African American or Native. I work in tribal communities. I've been working in tribal communities for 30 years. I cannot pretend to be them. I can just be who I am and work with integrity across those boundaries. So I come from Topeka, Kansas. I was born right before the Brown versus Topeka um, uh, Supreme Court um, desegregation, ma major, major uh, court, uh, whatever, decision, decision. Um, and, but my parents very much believed in that, and they were Jewish immigrants from escaping the Holocaust and Russian pogroms in that family, um, and raised me in a social justice ethical culture. And when we moved, and luckily for me as a teenager to the San Francisco Bay Area in the 60s, I was able to join the anti-war movement and participate in women's movement and um, work with the Farm Workers Union, et cetera. But I also very much was understood that I came from a heavily resourced, cult, with a lot of cultural capital, academic, uh, family, white, privileged in an upper middle class environment, and whoever I was going to be, that was going to be with me the rest of my life. And so I have to deal with those privileges and powers and my identity issues that are all important. As I've transferred some of that thinking in the academy, I took on, um, from very early on, um, working in English as a second language, the methodology philosophy of Paulo Freire, and um, have been, his work has been with me for my entire academic life in developing empowerment um, education, was greatly privileged to work with Dr. Ed Bernstein um, in the ASAP program in New Mexico um, in the 80s, an adolescent social action program really based in Frarian work. So that's where I also started my academic career as a researcher, but as uh, was mentioned, have worked in these other areas. And I consider two, I'm going to bring to you two of my research examples, one from the tribal research and one from trying to look at the theory and science of CBPR, because those are the core directions of my work these days. But I start still with Freire, and to be a good educator, he wasn't a researcher, means to have faith in people. We can't do it at the academy. We cannot change health inequities at the academy. 
what we need is partnering with our communities so that they, together, we can create and change things. So the second lesson is to understand our context and history. So there, to me, there's two contexts that I think about a lot. One is a scientific context, and that's the, con the challenge of bringing evidence to practice. And we all know the longevity of the length of time from laboratory to community. But for me, as an intervention researcher, it's the issue that internal um, validity is in insufficient. You may prove effectiveness in or efficacy in Chicago. It's not going to work in the Pueblo of Jemez in New Mexico. And so we really have to understand that external context and, the, and growing and emerging and solidifying implementation science, the importance of context. It's back to Rich's first thing of social and community context being important. But I think any intervention has to be thought through. You don't just take something off the shelf. And to me, it's working with community partners to recreate it in the appropriate context in that environment. Second challenge in a scientific way is what is evidence? And again, we're used to the evidence being generated in academic publications, but to be honest, the only evidence that exists really is that which has sufficient funding to be evaluated and systematically evaluated and get into the academic literature. There's a lot of evidence, and again, again, working in tribal communities, there's a lot of cultural evidence and a lot of knowledge, community knowledge, and what, of course, our colleague Larry Green has talked about as practice-based evidence, and of course, in clinical settings, there's a lot of practice-based evidence, but that these evidences are not necessarily in the academic literature. And I think it's been a disservice to our work to only consider academic evidence as key. And I think we have to broaden and create hybrid interventions. Of course, the, second, the third challenge is research mistrust, historical abuses. And unfortunately, even in still how translational, we're all now, we greatly embrace translational science. Often that's considered as a one-way unidirectional model versus a bidirectional model. And so it leads to the fourth challenge. If it's only unidirectional, it's hard then to translate findings into action and policy and practice changes because the community hasn't owned it as their own. Change happens in those settings. It doesn't happen just because we publish it and say it should happen. So we know the research history, obviously, through Tuskegee. I don't know if people know of the Havasupai. How many people have heard of the Havasupai? Okay, some of you indeed. So this is a current example. Havasupai tribe is in the Grand Canyon in Arizona. They had a diabetes research project, but their blood samples were taken by other researchers sent around the country to be used for other uh, health exploration that was not within their understanding of what was gonna happen. So um, studies were made using their blood samples on schizophrenia, on inbreeding, on other issues. A graduate student who was a stu Havasupai tribal member heard about this in a seminar and took the knowledge of the abuse of this to back to her tribal leaders. This, of course, exploded. There was a lawsuit. They had to settle the lawsuit because um, the actual tri uh, consent form was a little ambiguous, so it was not completely illegal what had been done in the abuse of their blood. And blood is a sacred fluid in these communities, and so it couldn't, it was even more um, an abuse of eth ethical abuse. Um, you have, uh, ASU had to um, settle for millions to the tribe. They also had to create uh, memorandums of agreement with all the tribes in Arizona. I'm saying this because this is in the last decade. It isn't Tsuki, uh, Tsuki, what am I saying? It isn't Tuskegee. Tsuki's a tribe that I also work with, sorry. Um, it is, um, and it reverberated throughout Indian country. I don't know if it got into other communities, but it affected my work in New Mexico. It affected colleagues' work throughout the country. So we do have to be careful ethically to respond to what does it mean to partner in a way to own um, uh, that kind of accountability and responsibility with the communities you're working with. So the third lesson for me is what are my core values and how do I start this work? I showed you my Frarian quote that I keep with me. But also these are CBPR principles. You've probably seen them from Barbara Israel and colleagues. Um, I also incorporate, because of my work in tribal communities, the principles from tribes where you have to respect the tribal systems, 
you require government approval. I can't just walk on a reservation. I have to be invited, and I have to have approvals, et cetera. And that the data belongs to the tribe. Which means that I can't publish it unless it's a collaboration, unless it goes through all the tribal approval processes. In one grant, that the grant that major grant we're working on right now, I go through the UNM IRB, I go through Navajo Nation IRB, I go through Southwest Tribal IRB, and I go through the, the, the tribal council resolutions. So my approvals are many, um, but in that way we are sure not to repeat violations that people have been subject to in the past. And the question, of course, for in communities that don't have this kind of governmental uh, level, what kind of accountability can we all have as researchers to African American communities, Latino communities, immigrant communities, LGBT communities that we're maybe not um, part of, but we and don't have the same legal structure? But it's a, it's an ethical question rather than for me a legal requirement. Um, so lesson four, it's all about relationships and commitment, and it's about showing up. Mary Northridge from American Journal of Public Health years ago published a really sweet little editorial about CBPR when she was editor of the journal, and she said it's about showing up, it's about listening, listening, and listening again, and it's about social justice, and that's what community engagement is all about, so I keep some of that with me as well. Thank you, Mary. Um, so just a quick example from my own work. Um, this is work with three tribes. It started in 1999 and some CDC grants. And NARCH, NARCH is an NIH-funded mechanism. It stands for Native American Research Centers for Health Mechanism. It's the only mechanism in NIH that requires that the PI be the tribe or tribal entity. The PI cannot be the university. Power differential and creating an equal system between communities is very much driven by funding, and this was the only NIH mechanism to do this, um, obviously, again, because of legal sovereignty issues. But I've had a series of NARCH grants because the tribal entity then contracts with university partners. So we're the contractors rather than the PI of the whole. Um, so we started with some tribal communities doing what we called exploration, community voices. I would not say the first two um, boxes here were CBPR or driven by community priorities. We had ideas, we went to people that we knew in the tribes, we said, are you interested in looking at kind of the capacities of the tribe, doing a profile with the tribe around doing a commu big community assessment. They agreed, they thought it was interesting, but it didn't come from them. As we move through the qualitative and quantitative assessment, they began to see, and they became part of our teams, the community advisory boards, and they began to do the interviews themselves and be part of the both quant and qual um, assessments, and then do part of the interpretation with us. They began to identify issues that were important to them. And they came to us and said, would you, we're really concerned about the loss of culture and language. We're concerned that the children aren't le listening to the elders anymore. We're concerned about the health of our families. And they said to us, can you help us find an intervention? So I'd say by the third box over there, NARCH 3 grant, we were finally doing CBPR, where we were finally being led by our community partners of what they felt was needed. And of course, these communities have a lot of substance abuse and social dysfunction and other issues, but they also wanted to draw on their cultural and family strengths and all of the um, work that they could provide as colleagues with us. So we identified an intervention from the Anishinaabe people in northern uh, Minnesota that was a family strengthening program. We went to them, we asked them, they had, were in a collaboration with the University of Nebraska. We said, can we borrow your curriculum? Can we look at it? They were um, very amenable and we've maintained relationships with them all of these years. And they, we took two years in each of the communities to revise that curriculum and what we call to recenter the program in the context of a Navajo context and a Pueblo context. We did it together so that we kept similarities, but we also had differences. We then, an Apache community came to us through other um, mechanisms of connection, and they said, can we join you? So we got another grant, another pilot, and we, so we piloted this. This pilot data gave us enough to then say to all of the three communities and our tribal partners from the health department, we worked primarily with the health departments and education departments, but of course had to have um, tribal leadership support as well. 
to say, you know, small communities, it's really hard to prove effectiveness of a program. Um, how would you join together as a three part and share your data with each other? That was a huge request on our part, and they said yes. So they were, were able, we're in this night at R01 right now, um, we're in the third year, finish going to the fourth, of, of collecting data on this program. Here's the program. It's a family intervention with elders, fourth and fifth graders, and their parents. It's a dinner based program. We have 12 sessions, we have components of sessions, tribal history, my family, tribal way of life. All of this has been an opportunity for the elders to share their own history. Of course, it's similar in the general title of the component, but what they do is different in each community. Um, and then we look at a community empowerment approach where the families take on the community challenge and develop a um, community action project back to their own community. We also have all these later sessions that are more cognitive behavioral, indigenized um, strengthening programs of communication and uh, uh, activities, communication. So, um, and then you can see that how the sessions work. Um, I'm gonna have to, we're gonna, I'm gonna show pictures of the family right now and I have to remove them from the web so I'll just show you them but I, it's my um, agreement with my tribal partners that I don't have their pictures of families put up on the web. So just, you'll be able to see them. But so here's a family strengthening and fun, why our family dinner is important. Oh, a community history session. Um, this is the kids sharing their pulling together their community history from the 1300s all the way to the 20th century or 21st century. Community challenges and visions, they create the vision of what is a healthy community for themselves and the challenges is what they address and choose for a community action project. And then they present, the kids present, the grown-ups present, they get to learn from each other and they say that the family dinner and learning their Indian names and the clan names and one of the communities, Jemez Pueblo, it's all conducted in the Towa language. So it's all conducted by community members. We as the researchers are, are supporting them. And then the community action project. Our pilot results that we're finding in terms of reduced anxiety, depression, pride, and a lot of system changes. We're trying to develop prevention continuums across the whole community with education and health working together, looking across the life cycle is the biggest exciting effort for us. And pieces of the curriculum, they're now inserting into the schools. So of course, sustainability is a big issue when you have grants. Um, and um, So the fifth lesson is listening. And again, how we listened in developing this program with them over a two year period before we even implemented the pilot. But there's other forms of listening and a few examples. We used to say we want to institutionalize, we want to institutionalize this program, how are we going to do this? And finally, it took a while, they said to us, don't ever use that term again. Because institutionalized means historical genocide in boarding schools and in other ways that we have been treated. We said, oh, okay, we didn't even, we didn't even know. I also have been working with the, uh, the Center for Deaf Health at the University of Rochester, and we always say, we want to promote community voice, promote community voice, and they said, when you use the term voice, that's English language oppression. So it's just a matter of listening to who we're working with. That's the major message, and recentering in community knowledge and decision making. You see that, that we moved from community advisory boards to now calling our co-researchers in communities tribal research teams, and that has helped a lot to establish equity in our way of thinking to each other. Um, it changes research, and just one example from a Navajo linguist, we spent a lot of time uh, translating a community survey into Navajo with a Navajo linguist, and we got to then the Likert scales, and they said, well, in Navajo, it's either yes or no. You don't have strongly disagree and, str and disagree and and we said, but our biostatistician says, and they said, well, in Navajo, this is how we answer our question, you know, and we tell a story after we say no or yes. And so we listened and we had to confront our biostatistician and we did yes or we had to use yes or no for the Navajo elders who we were interviewing. So it does change the research, and we had to deal with that in our bio. So then we had to collapse the, the um, in another Pueblo that we were doing a similar community assessment survey, they, we had to collapse the Likert scales into yes and no. So we, we had to respond 
to our community, and you can argue with me about the science, but I was trying to be responsive to our community partners. So lesson six for me, and this is where I'm gonna end, is kind of studying the science of CBPR. And what does this mean? And we've had three stages, and we started in 2006 with some early pilot grants from, from NIMHD to, to do the conceptual development, to develop a model. We then had a four-year grant, we call it stage two, called the Research for Improved Health Study, where we surveyed partnerships around the country, 200 partnerships around the country, and we established measures and metrics of CBPR. We're trying to look at what are the promising, pr practices that really support and improve outcomes of engagement, that not just any type of engagement is the same and not just any type of engagement is as effective. And the third cycle we're on now funded from the National Institute of Nursing Research where we've been refining the instruments, translating them into Spanish. We've surveyed another 200 partnerships, so we have close to 400 partnerships surveyed around the country. And we're developing intervention and tools to support partnerships to strengthen their work whatever area they're working in, whether it's substance abuse or domestic violence or um, environmental toxins, whatever. This is our model. Does it look complicated? Uh, it, it's actually very simple. All it says is that context matters. Here you get, again, Rich, thank you. Context matters, whether it's social context, political context, what health issue you address, level of collaboration. It's on my website too, you can just get it off, capacity level, um, that the kind of partnership processes have three sides to them. We're all involved in the relationship side. How do we build trust, safety, decision making, all of that together. But structurally also, who's involved? Are the right people involved? Are the right agencies involved? Who's missing at the table? Do you have agreements? Do you have data sharing and ownership agreements? The structural parts can matter. And individuals also matter. Not everybody, I say, should walk out of the halls of the university and go into the community. I think it takes a certain kind of flexibility of a person who wants to do this kind of work. If you're partnering, it changes the intervention, for me as an intervention researcher, but even as an epidemiologist, it changes the science. And so that's the third bubble, and it really matters to think about that and be thoughtful well, to be thoughtful of how you're making changes. I said it took us two years to recreate that curriculum in our three tribes, slightly different, also shared, creating culture-centered interventions in those communities. We had a lot more partnership synergy, and this bubble here of appropriate research design means that the research design changes if community members are involved, not just in deciding the problem, but in the data collection, Maybe they don't do the SPSS analysis, but they can do the interpretation and they can do the dissemination and return to action results. They own then the process to be involved in the action of practice and policy changes that you're hoping for. And of course, and the outcomes are quite broad from sustained partnerships or projects, shared power relations in research, these intermediate outcomes, cultural revitalization, and of course we want to improve health and health equity. And you know, social justice as an outcome as well. So in this second stage, we actually were able to, as I said, do internet surveys of 200 NIH partnerships. These are federally funded, actually um, also CDC and not just NIH, but CDC and AHRQ and others. This is pre pcori and we did seven in-depth um, case studies, so trying to bridge together qualitative and quantitative understandings. I'm just going to show you that, and this is again also on my website if you're interested, we're trying to look at what we could measure. So context, it's really hard to measure in a survey instrument. So we did a lot of qualitative work. We measured numbers of approvals. You see the red here is what we initially measured. The blue items are those we have scales for that came in the second iteration of the Engage for Equity survey. So. Um, we have measured a lot of part, a lot of the measures we found in the literature and those we developed are in partnering processes, you know, of course. Those have the most de developed. We also added a lot related to structural formal agreements because we thought that those are really important um, uh, to understand and it's specifically the percent of dollars to the community or the community agency or the clinic or whoever. Very key to power shifting and equal power relations. 
We then have measured culture centeredness of interventions, partnership synergy, and community members involved in research is actually an index we took from UCLA colleagues. So there's other work going around the country. We try, we've been trying to build from all of the research that we could identify from around the country of good metrics and measures to then create one. We have a psychometrics paper out of our first survey instrument. We're just putting together a psychometrics paper out of our second one and we're finding um, that, and these are a set of outcomes we're measuring, we're finding that um, there's a lot of overlap, that things are being revalidated. So we're actually quite thrilled about our measures. These are some of the stage two findings. These are initially promising practices that um, are shown to be associated with outcomes, with sharing the CBPR principles and values, community involved in all stages of research, that partners believe they have impact, influence, leadership, um, and culture centeredness. And we can, if you're interested or you can catch me during the day, or if you, we will, we have a paper out, it's not yet published yet, but we have a paper in, process, um, in, pre, in um, submission on that. So the new in, uh, stage three is this refinement. Um, and we have now, we're trying to develop an idea that, that you can see pathways to change. So the top is really a relationship pathway and the bottom is a structural pathway, which shows that if you have appropriate capacity in your community and your partnering, there then grows to be a commitment to cultural centeredness and fit within that community. Then relationships are impacted as they're more become more equal, then that improves synergy and then a set of outcomes. Or if you have a certain sort of a structural agreements, it's another pathway. Everybody does a mix. It's not like these are separate pathways, they're all interrelated, but what we're showing is that these things matter for outcomes, which is very exciting. And we're then developing um, a set of tools, and this is where lesson seven, it's all about empowerment, because I think what we're talking about is shifting the power relations in research. And um, from Julian Rappaport to my own, um, uh, Way. I think the reflection that we're doing, we've created a tool to reflect and use the CBPR model as a visioning tool. It's about reflexivity as an empowering process for people to create their own models. And we've been doing this around the country. We also have been looking at when people think of their own cases, where do they start? Where do they start their partnering? We did a case study in the Bronx Health Reach, a faith-based organization. We said, how did your partnership start? They said, well, let's talk about the burning of the Bronx in the 70s. They didn't get funded in the burning of the Bronx, but that's what they started with. That history was what was most important to them and the pastors that had been part of the civil rights movement who then were, became the activists in coalition with all of the NIDDK intervention, research grants, REACH grants, every other kind of grant, but they came from their own history. And so that kind of empower, you know, building in, on, around the empowerment idea. So again, I ask us all to be reflexive on our own power and identity, their university teams, their community partners. What's most important to me as a white researcher working in na native tribal communities, that I have native scholars on my university team, not as just students, but as staff and faculty. And that's been very core to my capacity, not that I'm gonna I'm a good person, I, I am flexible, I, I have friendships, but, but it really has mattered. And I think this bridging and reflection is important because we so typically assume power as academics. We're the ones doing the writing. We're the ones making the decisions on the funding unless, again, we do subcontracts out. We're the ones asking, you know, who has the voice? So it's very important to think about. So we only do co-authored publications, of course, with our tribal partners. And finally, I think it's really important for us to change, and I've hopefully expressed a whole lot of reasons and how universities can change um, and how we integrate CBPR it, with these foci on uh, research based on community priorities, building from knowledge, focusing on empowerment, and what people in the global south are now calling knowledge democracy. I find that a really interesting way of thinking. And again, creating not just focus groups for participation, but structures that make decisions. Who we're working with. Again, our move from community advisory boards to tribal research teams. That's a big difference. Um, so here are my lessons, and I just want to thank everyone, and um, thank you as um, 
for listening and thank my Engage for Equity partners and here is our new book coming out in November 2017. So thank you very much. So I think we have a few minutes for questions. Rich is saying he, we do, so, or comments or thoughts. Yes. So there's limitations and the answer is both and. Because yes, I'm a mixed methodologist. I, I believe in, in incorporating qual and quant together all the time. When, when we trained our Navajo researchers to go out and do the interviews in that survey, they didn't really capture all the stories right then. But we had in addition to that focus groups and interviews with elders that were different. So when they were administering the survey, even though the elders or others might have launched into a story, we weren't training our interviewers. They were just answering the questions on the survey. So they were getting the yes, no's. But we didn't end there. I know. No, it's 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 all of our struggle, and of course, there's no one answer to that. And I, we were approached by the Rochester Healthy Community Partnership, working with the Mayo from the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, and um, they work with um, Somali, Cambodian, Latino communities, and they decided as a whole, as they started with Cambodian and then moved to add the other ones, that they would stay together. They didn't break up into separate partnerships. They kept it together, and so they made that decision. They started with a, um, a literacy center at, that was serving pre predominantly, well, you know, um, it could have been anybody, but at the time it was serving predominantly Cambodian. But, but, but at the same time, they, you, you always start somewhere. What, and a lot of our work in communities is based on what we call, we have a measure of this, of trust scale proxy trust. You know, you meet somebody who meets somebody who trusts you, who invites you in, and so we, we kind of, but you can lose trust in a minute. But if you get, you can get in through proxy trust, and you start there, and you say, and then you ask yourself, is this the only group that I'm working with? Is this the, so there's multiple levels. Obviously, people on the ground, you know, PCORI has been really important in bringing in patients as new kinds of partners who are not your typical agency people. Um, and so that's been a great advance. We have PCORI grants in our current study as well uh, as part of our 200 partnerships, so we're gonna look at those differences. But I don't think you can, you know, you have to keep asking the question, who's missing? And who's the hidden voices? And you know, there's, a, there's also in communities what are called poverty pimp organizations that are really negative in that, uh, you know, and you might end up with them inadvertently or but see it's a matter of I think it's a matter of listening and asking that reflexive question all the time who's missing and whose voices do we need at the table obviously if you're working with youth you should need to find the way to work with youth um, whether through the schools or through youth, boys and girls clubs or through youth organizations or just finding the you know people on the ground who will connect you to the right leaders the informal leaders are often the best and we do that even in tribal communities, though there are very much formal structures. We started with five people at an advisory council in one community, no elders, no youth, and we said, we're missing this whole group of people. So we went to the senior centers, we invited elders, went to the schools, we had the youth doing videos for us. We started expanding, and that's not an answer, but it's just an attempt to say we just keep trying. And I don't, you know, I don't, and I actually know, don't use the term anymore, representation. I don't think anybody represents anybody. And all we're doing is we're finding, we're finding people who are actively interested in working together, who want to work with us, and asking that question, who's missing? Because always that's important, because there are those voices, even though I shouldn't say voices, there's always those people who are missing. Yes. Uh -huh. 
relate, related to that, I wonder if you had any comments on um, informed consent and the unit of, uh, of informed consent. Is it the individual? Is it the family? Is it the community? Is it the tribe? And how do you, how do you uh, broker that? Well, I have to navigate all. Because obviously working with children, you have the children assent and the, and the parent consent. You have to have both. Um, I mean, we have to follow traditional IRB regulations on working with children. But we also have, tri have to have tribal consent. And the Navajo Nation IRB process asks for an additional element of IRB, which typical universities don't ask for. They ask you to provide a benefit statement of how you're going to provide technical assistance and education back to the community and they will not give you your IRB unless they are clear that that's your orientation. So it is at a level, it's a tribal level that is additional. So it's a community benefit um, requirement that's in addition. So um, we, had a, we had a conflict with one of our case studies, it was a tribal case study where we had been doing inter a lot of interviews on, on our CBPR, what are the engagement processes, whatever. We send back all of our interview transcripts to the individuals. We sent back uh, aggregate community, re uh, community voices uh, with had a lot of different quotes. We kind of created a summary. And then the tribe came back to us and said, we want to own the data. And we said, well, no, well, we have our informed consent says it's all confidential with our community interviewers, interviewees. And they said, I, we don't care. We want the data. You know, but, and they had not, you know, the Navajo Nation has a repository set up. It's a very professional way of claiming and, and holding data. This is a tribe had, didn't, have, didn't have that process at all. So we actually had to go back and reconsent every single interviewee and focus group member and all of our, we had to reconsent everybody and ask if they would be willing to have their private interview um, put into the tribal offices. So, I mean, <clears throat> that was our solution. But, um, you know, I, it's, there can be those conflicts, but we do have the, I do work with this multiple level. I actually know that a lot of community IRBs are developing in the country and they are going to be requiring and wanting similar kind of options of holding data, so it's going to be an issue. And they, might, and they also require, and we have a whole section in the book on ethical issues, but a, a level of responsive community accountability, which is different than just individual harm benefit ratios. So I think the community accountability responsibility um, talk is really important. And I'm used to it through the Navajo Nation, but um, a lot of people aren't used to it. But these community IRBs around the country are growing. And our community review boards, they may not be official IRBs, they might just be review boards, but that still brings a level of accountability or responsibility back. So, and you can get into challenges, yes. So, it's very nice to hear the, the story of CBPR. And it, one of the interesting things is that it seems to have evolved and elaborated around some of the important tensions in public health between research and practice, internal and external validity. Yeah academic and community. And I think what's interesting is that three of those, I think, have been more or less institutionalized, if you will, and resolved. CTSA has kind of institutionalized the community piece. Implementation sciences is really an active enterprise in the external validity piece. But I think the research practice tension is still mm -hmm. something that we're really trying to handle, particularly in academic settings. I, I wonder if you can comment a little bit on, on that, that struggle and how uh, you know, how we can really try to make sure that practice has the same value and, and uh, Well, I strength. do think it's within us as academics to be valuing the practice and to be valuing it through our own practice of how we conduct research and to be valuing it in our engagement and part. It kind of comes, comes together with the engagement piece, how we value our um, engagement with our clinical partners or our CBO partners or our tribal partners or um, and youth partners. So I do think it's not, you know, the evidence-based research and research-based ev evidence and, or evidence-based practice, practice-based evidence. How do we, I mean, I'm, I call it sort of, how do we create a hybrid science? A hybrid science can be that we bring the practice-based evidence equally to our um, evidence-based practice um, together and say, what does that mean to our work if we do things in a hybrid way? So I don't think that's, accepted as a term these days by others necessarily, but I do think that's a, a, a 
part of us all who care about it, who write, we should be writing about it, trying to uh, make those changes and trying to change. That's how, where I think universities have to change, you know, and in terms of um, bringing also um, scholars of color into the academy, that changes because a lot of scholars of color have a lot of deep connections to their communities, and that would change the practice as well because they recognize the value of the community knowledge that often those of us on the outside don't see. So I think that that kind of academic um, change will help this. It might be slower, but it will help. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. with the issue related to the academy and being able to do that, and I appreciate my colleague's statement about practice. That's always been a real problem. The other part of it is the inequity within the system itself in being able to actually implement this. Um, if you're in uh, resource, a lot of the resources, you've been able to do this over time. In areas where the resources themselves are a real challenge, like in rural areas of the country, where the need is much greater than the ability to apply, that is a real challenge. I was just wondering whether or not, I mean, the tribes in some way cross the, you know, between those in some way. However, the reality is, is that in many of the, the rural areas in our country itself, this is the work that actually many do. However, the ability to actually sustain that is a real challenge. That's my first question, which I, should, I know you know what that is. So the second question I have, though, is actually the ability to keep the pipeline open. You know, we have a lot of interest, but our challenge is really to get uh, both students, other faculty, other people who are willing to do that commitment because the research is there, the money is there, but actually it takes more than just that to do this kind of work. And, and, and that seems less of the incentive realization to do that these days is significantly less. You know this already. And I was wondering what you might say on those two things in terms of the rural uh, engagement issue, I mean really engagement, and then the ability to keep the pipeline going uh, uh, via the ability to, to go over and above, so to speak. Well, I do think the um, rural and other under-resourced areas, urban, et cetera, you know, a lot of talk has been, you know, NIH dollars still flow. The biggest FNAs come from NIH dollars. We need that um, at universities. But community groups also need that. And in fact, that NIH, I mean, if we can influence NIH funding or, or, or foundation funding to put infrastructure dollars into community CBOs, and um, that's what's needed because they don't have, to really develop that capacity to become, um, you know, to be able to then get other research dollars or other grant dollars, whatever, program dollars, that infrastructure. And it just, it's not, that's not the way it, the framing happens for research. But if we really believed in community engagement, we would say a requirement like the NARCH dollars. The NARCH requirement is that a 30% of the whole money goes to the tribe or tribal entity. So 30% of a large research center is a lot of money, and that's infrastructure money. So it doesn't happen in other communities, but it could and should, and there's a precedent at NIH already. So, you know, if we could influence that. Um, and foundations should be open to that, and often are, actually. But the pipeline, I think, you know, a lot of the training centers are still very active, and we have to keep honoring that and having regranting mechanisms and any slush funds that deans have, I really support as regranting for students and fa junior faculty to kind of engage. You, you know, I, I think that that it helps. I think, you know, those kind of um, incentives are important. And CBPR are long processes and people come in at slices to do a master's thesis or a dissertation, so you have to figure out how to help people take off a piece and still benefit because otherwise they won't, they can't do it. So it's part of us as more senior people to be able to help create those slices for, you know, to support that pipeline. And a lot of us do internships and whatever, but it's, I think there's some financial incentives that could be added at, at, in academic units like these regranting small pilots, as well as um, making sure that you can slice up, your, you know, because you can't, uh, to do a whole CBPR project as a dissertation can be a disaster because you're there forever. So um, you have to have, create the, opportunity to en enable that, you know, piece of it. So I don't, you know, again, there are still a lot of training grants out there in, in NIH, and I, we, we need to keep supporting NIH to keep doing that, I think, is really a, another piece. And I don't the message has to get to NIH with a lot of this as well. One last short. Oh, one last short. short oh. answer. 
Short answer, sorry. I'm, I'm not sure it's a short question. But uh, first of all, thank you. That was a great talk. Uh, I actually have two questions. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> they gave me the mic. That's how it works. Um, it, it's about this concept that I think you, you call sort of democracy of ideas, which I like. But maybe I'm just going to do a slash equality of ideas. And I was wondering if you can comment on two issues that you raised. Number one is the issue that um, in publications, you have multiple levels. You use the word approval um, at the tribal level. So the first question is, how do you deal with the almost inevitable issue sometimes where you are publishing, you're trying to publish things that, that members of the tribe or members of leadership have an interest in not getting out there? So that's number one. The second issue, also on this issue of democracy slash equality of ideas, is you made the, the very interesting point about the Likert scale. You said, well, it's just not how we talk. And now, arguably, there actually are statistical best practices, and there's no question that Likert scales actually give you more discriminant validity. So, so what's the balance between doing what is culturally right, unquestionably, and w with what is going to give you greater scientific credibility? So I was wondering if you can comment on those two that tough questions. Thank you. Well, well, on the latter, I don't. I think it's an uh, it's a balance over a lifetime, and you make decisions at certain points in time. And if we were going to get any responses from any of our Navajo respondents, we wouldn't be able to use Likert skills. So we couldn't. You know, our balance on that was they our team wanted to do the survey. They really wanted to assess 250 households. They knew a lot of them would only be done in Navajo, and they wanted the, enough of the information that, that would benefit the tribe. So we made that decision at that point that either it's all or nothing because they wouldn't have done the survey at all. So you know, you, uh, yes, there would be more discriminant validity with Likert scales, but so on that, on the, on the knowledge democracy, um, the tribes would say, and other communities might say that for a long time we've had publications about us that were really hurtful and harmful, not just hurtful, but harmful to us, and we don't want that repeated. And so, and I've had, I haven't had my own publications stopped, or does, I have had colleagues who have had to work really hard to show that it's important to show this level of HIV um, prevalence or whatever in a tribe or whatever, and that kind of level of trust that you can build up managed to enable that publication to go through. It took a lot more work. So it's not that people just want to stop bad news. They want to stop the, abu the historic abuses. So it's a level of trust that comes from showing up and long-term commitment and building those relationships, which is one of my lessons. That doesn't mean that some publications haven't been stopped. They have. So, um, and then you just, you, you know, as a researcher, you just say, I know I'm going to deal with all these extra levels of approval. And a lot of people choose not to work with tribes. So that's another choice. That's the choice points. But it's, again, not a simple answer or a simple choice, but you just make them as you go. And I really do think that um, we do, as an acad acad academy, want to stop the view that research is harmful. That's important if we're going to move forward to solve problems of equity in our society. So we have a role in that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to move uh, right along. There will be a break, don't worry, and we will uh, make up some time. Next panel, what, next is our first panel, uh, and it's going to be on substance use and HIV infection. And the panel has, um, actually was going to have three presentations, uh, but it just has two. And that's because uh, the second presenter, uh, Jamila Stockman, uh, had a family emergency at the last moment and, uh, and had to cancel. So we, we miss her. Um, she's in our thoughts. And we will um, hopefully hear from her at some other time. Uh, Lisa Metch, uh, who is our discussant, will uh, cover some of the topics that uh, Professor Stockman was going to cover. The, so in this panel, we have uh, then two presentations and the first uh, will be by Angela Bazzi, and it's called The Role of Syndemic Barriers, sorry, Dis <laughs> Disparities in Access to HIV Prevention Innovations Affecting People Who Inject Drugs. Now, Angela is an assistant professor of community health sciences here at Boston University, and the goal of her research is to improve the health of socially marginalized populations. 
Um, informed by public health and social science perspectives, she employs quantitative and qualitative research methods to identify opportunities for prevention in diverse populations affected by HIV and substance use. Her research reported in 50 peer-reviewed papers to date has documented the HIV STI prevention needs of female and male sex workers and their partners, male couples, and people who use drugs in Mexico, Kenya, Ghana, and Boston. In 2015, she was awarded the prestigious Peter Paul Career Development Fellowship, and now with a Career Development Award from NIDA and support from an NIH Center for AIDS Research, or CIFAR, grant, she's studying antiretroviral pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, for people who inject drugs. Professor Bazzi. All right, well, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I think this will be a, a fascinating day, as it already is. Um, today I'll be talking about disparities in access to HIV prevention methods um, in a population affected by substance use. So I'd like to start with just a very general definition of health disparities, just to kind of um, ground us in this, which is um, health disparities are, um, broadly speaking, inequities in health status or access to treatment or prevention services. Um, and these result in a concentrated burden of disease that um, tends to affect groups defined by minority status, um, social disadvantage, or in the case of my research, social marginalization, which refers to the process of um, excluding someone or pushing them to the fringes of society where their basic health um, and other needs are more likely to be ignored. And HIV is an infectious disease that in many contexts um, disproportionately affects socially marginalized groups. Um, I'll be speaking about injection drug use um, as one um, form of HIV risk, um, also a, a large source of social marginalization. So by thinking about the contexts that promote uh, the dual sexual and injection-related risks that affect people who inject drugs, I think we can more carefully and critically evaluate existing prevention options. Um, so not to belabor this too much, but um, if we think just uh, very quickly about um, preventing sexual transmission, we tend to focus on the promotion of, of condoms or barrier methods, um, which work very well in preventing HIV and other sexually transmitted infections, but they have to be used consistently, um, and that can be difficult in a lot of circumstances. Um, they also don't protect against injection-related risk or acquisition of the virus. Um, so for that, we tend to rely on the distribution of clean syringes, which also also work very well in preventing HIV and other bloodborne infections like hepatitis C, um, but obviously they, they do need to be used consistently, um, and the use of clean syringes alone won't pre prevent sexual acquisition of HIV, um, even though the programs that um, distribute syringes often provide information and referrals um, and condoms. Um, so we've now entered an era of antiretroviral um, prevention or, or biomedical prevention. And this is going in, in many directions right now with the research. I'll be speaking about pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is the use of antiretroviral, um, antiretroviral medications um, by uninfected individuals to prevent acquisition of the virus from either sexual or injection-related sources. Um, Currently, antiretroviral um, medications, or, or PrEP as we call it for short, um, are approved as daily oral medications, um, which can be difficult um, to use for some individuals. So there are longer acting formulations that are currently under development, but we know from a health disparity lens that um, delivering these innovations, once they are available, um, whatever they are, so the populations that most need them will require thinking about the contexts that uh, promote health disparities and um, social marginalization. In the case of PrEP, the vast majority of uptake globally has been among men who have sex with men. Um, and while there are significant disparities within that population, um, the focus of my current research is on um, differences in access across populations. Um, so injection drug use is still a persistent driver of <coughs> HIV infection in the United States. Um, however, even though PrEP is efficacious in this population for HIV prevention, um, uptake has been virtually non-existent to date, despite CDC and World Health Organization recommendations that it be provided, um, along with other essential services. 
Uh, there are a lot of assumptions about why PrEP uptake is low, um, why it, the use of it consistently might be difficult for people who inject drugs, but we don't actually have very much evidence and we don't know much about the perspectives of this population um, in, in their own words. So we're currently investigating PrEP acceptability and potential barriers to uptake and longer term use among people who inject drugs in the US Northeast. And um, we're recruiting people who inject drugs as well as key informants through community-based organizations here in Boston and in Providence. Um, and so we have um, a set of, uh, we refer to them as participants who are the people who inject drugs um, and then key informants who are social service providers um, and a handful of PrEP clinicians and experts. Um, but in this study, they're really all um, informants to us. Um, we're conducting qualitative interviews um, to explore uh, some of the, the potential issues surrounding PrEP use. Um, and I should say that although we're finding that um, PrEP awareness is very low in this population, interest is high once we explain what it is and how it works. And people have given us pretty specific ideas about who they think could most benefit from PrEP within that population uh, due to overlapping injection and sexual related risk. However, um, Today I'll be focusing on some of the findings that have emerged from our interviews having to do with um, barriers to access and disparities in um, the use of health services that affect this group. So we've found very low healthcare engagement um, and uh, people have described very negative experiences with healthcare, um, including experiences of disrespect um, in, in the past as well as quite recently. These data, I should say, were all collected in 2017. Um, so as one woman from Providence explained to us, the minute they find out you're a drug user, they don't wanna help you at all. You can see it right in their face. They change their whole attitude and how they look at you. It makes me uncomfortable, and I don't want to tell them I'm using. It makes me standoffish. It makes me want to lie. It's tough being a drug addict and getting medical care. Right away, they think you're just looking for something. But I'm like, buddy, I can get it on the street. I'm just here for this other issue, you know? So we're starting to see across the range of informants in our study um, that there's a lot of consensus that um, if PrEP were to be used in this population, it should probably be delivered through community organizations um, where there's more trust um, and more daily access. Um, so this was explained to us by a man in Boston who said that people feel more comfortable in a place like this than they do in a doctor's office. I don't feel embarrassed to talk to people over here. Uh, there's just some things I wouldn't tell a doctor. I can tell these people because they know where I'm coming from. They've been there, done that. Um, and most of us come here to the syringe exchange on a daily basis. Um, regarding potential adherence to this current uh, daily medication, um, we've heard about a lot of barriers um, that we went into this study anticipating. Um, some of them have to do with um, the sort of chaos and instability in people's daily lives. Homelessness and incarceration um, complicate that instability. Um, we've heard a lot about the context of addiction um, with people saying things um, like, you know, the drugs just take precedence over everything else. Um, and then from some of our outreach workers, we've heard um, almost a, a sense of hopelessness reflected in thinking about these issues um, with uh, a key informant from Providence telling us, that, you know, someone who doesn't have a place to stay on some level, it's almost a lost cause. They've, in a sense, uh, given up on the thought of ever being stable, and providers feel like it's a waste of time trying to counsel them, which could be a tough barrier to break. Um, at the same time, we've heard some contrasting perspectives on adherence um, for this population, um, with people saying things like, I'm so good at taking drugs, um, why can't I take something that's good for me? Or um, I show up at methadone, or I show up at the syringe exchange on a daily basis. Um, so we are hearing that kind of uh, a pushback from participants. Um, an HIV provider also told us, I'm shocked by how many people with drug histories, even active substance use, are able to take their HIV medications and suppress their viral load. If you take somebody who's not HIV infected but injecting heroin every day, that's a very routinized way of using drugs. Basically, they're taking their heroin like medicine. Uh, so people have told us that you know, these, um, these types of routines shouldn't be ignored in our research moving forward. 
Um, related to adherence, again, we've heard some pretty specific suggestions about what could be done to promote it, um, including things like very low-tech reminder systems, which is in contrast to some of the adherence intervention research um, that uses um, smartphones and apps um, and things of the like to promote adherence. Um, we've heard about um, ways of kind of integrating reminders into uh, the few routines that people do have, um, such as encouraging dosing of PrEP in the morning morning, um, which would be in line with um, specific drug cravings and related routines, um, leaving homeless shelters for the day and things like that. Um, and then we've also heard about um, trying to leverage experience that the population has using other um, drugs or medications, um, as well as leveraging support from peers and trusted outreach workers that the population has routine contact with. Um, as someone told us, it's always good to have somebody who's been through it, who can call to say, hey, take your medication today, or I know you're going to get high at six, so why don't you take it at five? Somebody who can relate to them and won't belittle them for their actions. So to wrap up, I'd like to um, summarize that the, the stigma surrounding um, injection drug use specifically and the social marginalization um, that is clearly very present um, in 2017 um, it can contribute to a context in which individuals are hesitant um, to access the few services that are available to them. Um, and so even though we've identified a lot of other barriers um, to, to prep um, uptake and use in this population, which I could, I could probably talk about in a much longer talk, um, I'd like to highlight how you know, that we're seeing that these negative experiences with healthcare um, present a particularly powerful challenge to prep delivery through traditional settings. Um, so even though um, you know, we clearly have a lot of work to do in figuring this out, um, it seems that um, there's something to be said for looking to community-based organizations and working with them um, to figure out how to better deliver prep to this group. So I'd like to just leave you with the argument that um, biomedical innovation holds great promise in promoting um, health and, and prevention, but disparities in access to new technologies have to be addressed so that these um, innovations can reach their full prevention potential. Um, and specifically, I think that efforts are needed to use the social and behavioral sciences um, and some of the perspectives uh, from communities um, that we're able to, to get through working with communities to monitor and develop strategies to remedy some of the things that contribute to social marginalization. Um, we also need to continue trying to identify um, and, and leverage sources of strength and resilience in communities. Um, and finally, um, we can use this work to inform debates about resource allocation um, in which the perspectives of the most marginalized groups often aren't included. Um, so with that, I'd like to briefly thank my funders, uh, my research collaborators and mentors, um, and all of the informants and community organizations that made this possible. Thank you. I think we do have time for one or two questions, particularly clarifying questions, uh, because Professor Bazzi will be back on the panel at the end for the full discussion. But if there are a couple questions, we could take them now. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hi, thanks for the talk. Um, hi, everyone. My question to you is currently the PrEP is being administered as a pill. Yes. And I'm not sure how easy it is to go from a pill to like intravenous like injection. But I'm just thinking if you're going to meet people where they are at, maybe one way of getting the PrEP to these folks would be to see if this medicine could be done through injections. And it's just a thought. Because that way, they already have that unfortunate predisposition to receive dosing in that way. So that may be one way to get it to them. That's a great point. And um, we do, um, fortunately, have an injectable form of PrEP um, that's currently undergoing testing. Um, actually, it's, it's entering efficacy trials right now. And um, we've asked participants about that a little bit. We've heard from some people that um, it could potentially be triggering for them. Um, especially if they're trying to start the recovery process. Um, but I think it, it would be something that um, you know, we, we can continue to explore um, in thinking about the new innovations that are coming through the pipeline. Is that, you know, it may be that um, certain, just like birth control, um, you know, some delivery 
methods are, are better um, for some people than others. So that's a great point. Thank you, That's, that was terrific, thanks. Uh, next presentation, Professor Margie Skier. Margie is a graduate of Boston University twice, uh, School of Social Work and School of Public Health, Associate Professor of Public Health and Community Medicine uh, at the School of Medicine at Tufts University and Interim Director of the Master of Science in Health Communication. Her current research focuses on adolescent substance misuse prevention from epidemiologic, qualitative, and inter intervention development perspectives. Her over 40 peer-reviewed publications cover her work in which she's studied family engagement and the role of family meals, a methamphetamine use communication intervention for teens through dental practices in rural Idaho, and preventive interventions for parents of third to sixth grade students in Boston, as well as studies of HCV and HIV co-infection in people who inject drugs, and she's gonna to talk to us about beyond just say no, novel strategies in adolescent substance misuse prevention. Professor Skier. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Rich, for that introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here today, and I'm really excited to be part of this discussion about defining community health sciences, because I think I've taken for granted Yes, of course we all know what community health sciences is, and then when you ask the question to delve in deeper, it actually, there is a question mark. So um, my work, as um, Dr. Sage just said, is really around developing substance use preventions, and for the past 20 years I started as a social worker, thanks to my BU School of Social Work degree, um, working in drug rehabilitation centers and realized very quickly that working on the prevention side would be most hopefully lucrative in terms of preventing um, addiction uh, uh, from the outset. And so I'm going to describe two of the studies that I've been working on. Um, around how to utilize community health sciences and engage in the, with the community in different communities to actually work on prevention in adolescents. And before I do that, I wanna put our, the, my work sort of into context around what we are currently living under. I assume that many of us understand or remember the Just Say No campaign from the 80s, which was launched by Nancy Reagan, um, who was the first lady at the time. And this Just Say No campaign was very much aligned with the war on drugs, which, again, many of us may know, had incredibly detrimental effects as it came to um, disparities in racial and ethnic health and incarceration rates around who was arrested, and that has since skyrocketed and it continues to this day. And so when we hear Just Say No and Dare and all the things that kind of came along with it, everyone kind of cringes, people who know, right? We all cringe. And yet in March of this year, the new Attorney General of the United States said, I think we have too much of a tolerance for drug use, psychologically, politically, morally. We need to, as Nancy Reagan said, just say no. Educating people and telling them the terrible truth about drugs and addiction will result in better choices by more people. We just need to tell people that what they're doing is wrong, right? Isn't that what community health sciences is all about? Right, this is, this is absurd. And it's incredible because again, this is right now, as Dr. Wallerstein said, this is happening, right? These are things that aren't happening in the 50s, in the 80s, this is happening right now. And so part of, I think, defining the field is recognizing that, you know, when we see something like this that really ignores decades of research that indicates that this isn't the case, Part of what we need to do in terms of defining the field is not only what we do, but also railing against what the evidence shows us is wrong, such as this, and even more so can be dangerous, because we did see that even in the D.A.R.E. program of the 80s, that there were actually increases in substance use. So I say all this to just contextualize, we're living in this currently, and the work that we do really needs to be thoughtful about what our current climate is when we think about prevention efforts. So as I get off my soapbox, I will, um, 
say that all of the work that I do really is nested or is contextualized within the social ecological model. And I know this is the theme of the day, context matters, it's incredibly important. And when I, th when I work with youth and I think about youth, um, I always think of them in the context of the social ecological model because we all live within our, our larger context, but they in particular are so susceptible to influences of their contexts. And one of the contexts that is so incredibly important to, to youth, adolescents, is the family environment, because it's been shown to be an incredibly important determinant of risk behaviors, including substance use. And numerous studies, numerous observational studies, have demonstrated that children who eat meals with their families on a regular basis are less likely to drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, use other drugs, in addition to a whole host of other risk outcomes, reductions in violence and academic failure and mental health outcomes. So we see this sort of magic bullet sort of an intervention that has been shown on the um, individual level. And it's even being used in the lay community. We have a family dinner project that came out of Cambridge that promotes family meals. And about a year ago, a second grade teacher from Texas, I believe, Miss Brandy Young, uh, sent a ho new homework policy home, a letter home to all the kids' parents saying, we're not gonna do homework, but instead spend more time together. And in fact, it says, eat dinner as a family. So we're seeing this promoted constantly in the lay community. But up until now, we really haven't seen this intervention strategy be used to try to promote meals um, as a way to reduce substance use among youth. So several years ago, I designed an intervention called the Supper Project, sub substance use prevention promoted by eating family meals regularly. And I was sitting in my office and I came up with this acronym, very proud of myself, because, <laughs> right, it's hard to come up with an acronym like that. So as I patted myself on the back, you know, and developed this intervention. I was very lucky to be funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse um, for an R34 to test the efficacy of this intervention, which focused on eating family meals together, and then also, on top of that, increased communication between parents and children, increased monitoring, and most importantly, under the guise of family meals, increased communication about substance use, because that's really, in many ways, where the prevention is coming from. And so this was um, a pilot randomized control trial of 70 parents and children between the great grades third and sixth in Boston public school system. And just the big picture results, we saw some ceiling effects around family meals, but this intervention, which included a, a handbook, it was a very brief intervention, a handbook, a, some text messages, um, a one-on-one -on -one meeting for one hour with an interventionist, and I can talk more at the break with anybody about the methodology, but we found that parents in the intervention group, there was a drastic increase in the number of parents who were speaking a lot to their children over three and six month periods around substances, around alcohol in particular, and also about marijuana and other drugs compared to parents in the control group. So we were really happy to see that doing a brief intervention with parents could really increase communication. And this was an R34, as I said, funded by NIDA. And right now I have an R01 under consideration to test this in a full-scale efficacy trial. And furthermore, to focus on quality, not just quantity of meals and quantity of conversation, but quality. What is happening at the meals? Because if you have a contentious family meal environment, that's really, that could be a very negative thing. Um, so what are the quality of conversation about substance use? So that's on the agenda for the future. Wish me luck. Um, and then another novel strategy, I, I heard some giggles. People may know who these lovely young ladies are um, from Orange is the New Black. I wanted to just tell you a little bit about another strategy, um, a communication strategy I'm working on around preventing substance use among youth Methamphetamine crystal meth use is really rampant in rural areas, and in northern Idaho, it's incredibly prevalent. And so I'm working with a colleague in, in uh, northern Idaho to develop a meth use preventive intervention to be delivered by dentists and dental hygienists 
to young people because meth very drastically affects the teeth. So if anybody has seen Orange is the New Black, no, not to be a spoiler alert, but the, the <laughs> character's teeth are, are very damaged. Um, and so using dentists and dental hygienists as a strategy, as a communication strategy to affect behaviors among youth, I think has a lot of promise. And we've been doing qualitative research right now key informant interviews with dentists and hygienists and focus groups with teens and with parents because we wanted to know would parents be amenable to their children hearing this information? Would teens be amenable to getting inter an intervention even if maybe they didn't realize it at the dental office? So we have gotten amazing data and we're in the process of analyzing it right now and we even think based on the data that we've collected we know what the intervention will look like um, the teens were really struck by seeing before and after pictures uh, of how quickly teeth and um, skin changes over the course of meth use even in a few months so we're going to be incorporating images pictures even potentially something that shows peop uh, young people now and what might happen to them if they started using meth because meth is a drug that even if it's used once could actually start down the road to addiction very quickly. So that is another area that I'm working on where we're engaging the community in a different way, thinking about how we can work in novel ways to, to approach young people because in my, in my work, in my thinking, Every level of the social ecological model that we can address, the better off we can be. We've seen this in tobacco, where we work on the individual level, the interpersonal level, the community, society, policy. Every place we can try to address intervention with young people around substance use, I think the better off we're going to be. And just because I have an audience, I'll tell you two other areas that I think are really going to be primed for novel strategies around communication and also intervention with young people. So the first area I think everybody knows about the opioid epidemic, yes, and um, pe most people probably have heard that four out of five people who are addicted to heroin started using pills. Now only 4% of people who use pills go on to use heroin or become addicted to heroin. But it's still, there is that connection. And, and if we are able to reduce prescription drug use, I think we'll be able to have an effect over time. And I'm, my strategy is working with pharmacies and pharmacy technicians to deliver uh, health communication messaging to parents in particular about properly securing their medication. So that's next on the horizon. And also, um, does anybody know what this is? Marijuana, right. So if you thought that this was a concession stand in a movie theater, you're wrong. It is a marijuana dispensary. These are pictures that I took in Denver right before, in, at APHA, right before we Massachusetts passed um, the legalization. And the novel strategy around marijuana I think will really be around edibles because it really does look like a concession stand. I went in and it, it was purely for research, I promise you. Um, I did, I even had to say to the person, I'm not gonna be a consumer, I just wanna, I just wanna find out what are you doing here because this is gonna pass in Massachusetts. And it was incredible, the variety of edible marijuana is, that's available and there are contests and it's just gonna be a field that we're gonna need to figure out how do we intervene and have communication strategies that will influence youth around this um, because it, youth are gonna be very susceptible to edible marijuana. So again, down the pipeline for me. And that's it, so I'll take a question. Okay. Yes. You mentioned the issue of marijuana and edibles. Um, one of the things that's troubled me from a prevention standpoint is with legalization, uh, we don't. Oh, I never told I needed this, so good. 
it, the issue about access. And so we tend to get, even with legalization, that's only for folks over 21. Yes. Can you talk about issues around access to marijuana, edibles or not, and from a prevention standpoint, some of the things that we need to be aware of as we move forward? We see increasing numbers of um, states actually legalizing or decriminalizing marijuana. Yes, absolutely. So I think from a social justice perspective, the legalization of marijuana is probably an incredibly important intervention. But from a prevention standpoint, so I, I wear these two hats of being a being somebody who's very invested in social justice, but also um, as a preventionist, I was always, I even wore seatbelts when I was a little kid and, you know, it was, it's been in my nature. Um, we need to think about what does this access mean? So. Even though dispensaries that sell edibles will only be available for people who are over 21, and the dispensary that I went into was ironclad. I don't think anybody would get into this one who wasn't 21 and older. That said, it is something that older siblings, I mean, we see this with alcohol a lot, right? Older friends, siblings, parents who may not think it's a big deal will be providing to young people. And, and edibles create a, an issue because it, they look like regular food. They taste like regular food and maybe even better because of all of these contests that are coming out around making them taste really good. Every type of food you could possibly think of, pasta sauce, soda, um, there's lip balm, there's, you know, every kind of thing besides just candy and baked goods. So it's something that kids are going to be able to bring into movie theaters. They're going to be able to bring it to school. And you may not know because they're not going to smell of anything. So as preventionists, one of the things we really have to do is be able to communicate with the young people in our lives around the dangers of marijuana use, but also be able to answer any questions that they have. We need to become educated. We need to know what the effects are, and how we can actually effectively communicate with young people. Because just telling them don't do it, the just say no approach, doesn't work. So we, we really need to use the evidence around talking with young people about substances, but specifically target edibles because they have dangers in and of, of themselves. So. Thank you, Margie. Thank you very much. We're going to go on to our discussant uh, because it's my hope that in, in, in bringing folks together in a room like this, the value is really being able to have discussion uh, between uh, those who've presented and, and everybody in the room. Um, our discussant, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Lisa Metch, um, and she is going to uh, present some information uh, from her own work as well as begin a broader discussion and then involve uh, all of us. Lisa is chair and Stephen Smith professor, sociomedical sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia. Her current work focuses on the uptake of HIV testing, linkage, treatment, retention, re-engagement in care, and viral suppression among vulnerable populations. She's been responsible for over $60 million in grant funding and currently leads the Florida node of the NIDA Clinical Trials Network. She's also the site PI of the NIH-supported women's interagency HIV study in Miami. Her findings on the value of integrating HIV testing in substance use treatment programs were the basis for SAMHSA and NIDA to develop an HIV awareness toolkit for substance use treatment providers. And her research uh, on HIV testing, uh, and I have a, a particular fondness for her line of research here. We were commiserating last night about how exciting it is to publish well done, null studies. Um, and uh, her research on HIV testing was used by the CDC in the decision to decouple risk reduction counseling and HIV testing. So Professor Match, please. Thank you to Professor Sates. I've been a long admirer of his work and to Dean Galea uh, for, for bringing us together in this wonderful hospitality. So in my time today, I am going to uh, try to integrate the wonderful talks that we just heard uh, from Angela and Marjorie and present some of my own uh, findings, and then hopefully we could open up for a discussion. Uh, the title of my talk is Social Context Matters, which is something I certainly learned from uh, Dean Galea when we had uh, two and a half years that we overlapped at the Mailman School of Public Health. And I will say for you at the Boston University School of Public Health, you know what it is like to work with greatness. I will always uh, appreciate those two and a half years, and, and we had a lot of fun. Uh, so, so just to uh, start, uh, 
I am the chair of the Department of Sociomedical Sciences, and as you will see in, in my research, uh, my own journey is I really came there um, having done a lot of trials at the individual level, and I've watched my own work move to, uh, to appreciate the importance of the social context and working at multi-levels and really taking advantage of the social ecological model. Um, so uh, the bottom line uh, that I just want to mention here, and this is really lessons learned for me as I think about the field of HIV and substance use, I really hope um, in the field that we can move more towards structural low agency interventions. I think when you talk about HIV and if you talk about uh, HIV treatment, it certainly is involved with taking pills. We are moving towards long acting uh, uh, treatments, but I think low agency interventions has been something that has not been um, really tested, and I think in listening to the last two talks, you really can appreciate that. Addressing the social determinants of health is key, and one of the things that I conclude in those, those null studies, negative findings, is that I think where we haven't been able to be successful sometimes uh, trying to, to work at the individual level, it's because of all the other issues that people face in their lives, and I was very struck this morning by Professor Wallerstein's talk um, and really sort of meeting people where they're at. And and while what we may think is important as researchers is not necessarily even salient in people's lives. Um, place and politics matter, um, as I will mention in my next slide, which I'll, I'll go to right here. Um, I moved to New York five years ago at Columbia University. It's a wonderful environment, but I spent almost 20 years in Miami, and Miami is my research home, and when you built those relationships with communities over all those years, you can't just go to a new city and start over, and I also put this this up as I was working on this because I was worried a lot about Miami this weekend. Uh, thank God, you know, most people are okay in, in Florida, not so good in other places like the Keys and, and the Caribbean, and we pray for all of those, those, uh, those communities. Um, so just in terms of HIV and substance use, and Angela spoke about injection drug use this morning, we've had great, great success in HIV with injection drug use. This is a slide that shows you the epidemic in the 1980s where you were seeing um, you know, almost 50,000 new cases of HIV among, uh, among injection drug users in the earlier years. Now, um, injection drug use represents less than 10% of new infections of HIV. Um, in a more recent slide, if you look in 2015, you've seen dramatic decreases. But that doesn't mean that we're not concerned about substance use in HIV. We know Scott County, Indiana, we had an outbreak you know, a year or two ago Go. Um, it's good that we have that person, that person from Indiana leading our country now. But, uh, but anyway, we, we at least have uh, some, some lessons learned. And I think the dramatic um, uh, success that we've had with injection drug use is because of the interventions done at the social context, particularly syringe exchange. We do have syringe exchange uh, programs all through the U.S., and that was what was needed and, and probably could have prevented that outbreak in Indiana. Um, I will tell you, though, getting back to my hometown of Miami, you know, we didn't have syringe exchange until last December in 2016. So it was the first time that syringe exchange came, and it was actually a, one of my former students, um, a, a brilliant young guy who got it through, by, but not really by research, it was by advocacy and politics and those factors when we think about interventions and where they work. And I think it's another place to really talk about in this, in this room when we think about community health science and that even in our United States, <coughs> New York and Miami couldn't be farther you know, different when it comes to the social structure. And so there, very often, you do have to think about high agency interventions because the social structure is not there, so people have to kind of make it happen on their own. And so when we look at PrEP, you know, we're so far away from uh, really, like in places like Miami, of, of trying to bring in PrEP. So you, with all that said, in the HIV field, everything is very aspirational. We hear about getting to zero. We hear about ending the epidemic. And I worry most about the people who are left behind in all the advances of HIV. And when we look at substance use in HIV, as I already mentioned, we had the outbreak in Indiana. Um, 
basically the strategies. This is an article published by Stephanie Strathy and Chris Bayer, and they really, a lot of these are focused on meeting people where you're at. The kind of comments we heard today, recognizing that, that drug, substance use, HIV, the systemic approach, I think that's what probably Jamila would have spoken about today if she was here. It's so important to, um, to recognize that this is, these are stigmatized issues that you really need to, uh, to work with community to, to put in the right strategies. So substance use continues to be a major driver. Injection drug use, we have seen cases go down, but as was mentioned by um, Marjorie, we have methamphetamine, we have stimulant use, we have the opioid epidemic. We know that up to half persons living with HIV have, have some type of substance use involvement. We know that substance use study after study, some by people in this room, um, that have shown that is, a, is, a, is, a, is associated with negative outcomes. Little has been done with PrEP. Um, we still have providers who are not putting people on therapy, and then the opioid epidemic raises major new concerns. So this is, this is one of those uh, negative studies that I published uh, last year in JAMA that was a study where we tried to work with uh, patient navigators and contingency management effective evidence-based strategies working um, to, to work with people in the hospital who these are patients who had not been in, in HIV care mostly off antiretroviral therapy all with detectable viral load and we, we were able in the short term to get people virally suppressed but in the long term we were not and when we took a little closer look at the data this was done in 11 cities through the US Boston was one of them and I will tell you to a credit to those of you from Boston and who work with Boston Medical Center we don't report the individual site data Mary Lynn Janoni and Meg Sullivan are the, the PIs but actually Boston the intervention worked the best so that does say something about, and, and I think it speaks to Rich Sates, to Jeffrey Samet, to the amazing addiction medicine team that, that works in BMC. Um, unfortunately, and if you look at the results here on this chart, you see the, uh, the, I circle the four sites, and these were the sites in the south. These were the Miami, Atlanta, Dallas, and that's where the HIV epidemic continues to rage, and that's where you don't have the social structure. And also, really importantly, when you look at the socioeconomic factors, you have unstable housing, you have food insecurity, you have mental health. So the syndemics, the, the, all the things that are going on, the stigma um, just makes it really hard for an intervention where we brought people to care, we paid people to go to care, they did go to care, but in the end, we, we were not successful. Um, and this has been shown in other studies. This is another study by Ryan Westergaard from the uh, live cohort at Johns Hopkins, and also he, following drug users over time, very low results on the HIV treatment cascade. Um, providers, uh, Marjorie was talking about providers. There's, in the HIV arena, um, we have amazing providers, some of them sitting in this room, Room, but we still have studies that are showing that HIV providers want to defer initiation of antiretroviral therapy. We're seeing it with hepatitis C, and we need to continue to work with providers. On the, on the flip side, this was an interesting study I just came across preparing for this talk. We, there was a study that just came out of the uh, Montefiore group that actually showed that HIV treatment providers, while well, one study shows they're not providing antiretroviral therapy, this study showed that the providers are giving a lot of prescription opioids. And, you know, so, so and I'm not saying that that's, you know, a bad thing. I mean, I, I think that you know, the, I've heard the strategy that if someone comes every, every visit with a, a, with a suppressed viral load, they'll give them a script. And, you know, it's just to basically, it's the, the provider trying to, to help them cope and to, and, you know, and to deal with things. But it is, you know, these things are concerning. And I think Marjorie mentioned the opioid epidemic. We know that that is one of the factors that's associated with decreased life expectancy. Um, we see recent increases um, in, in hepatitis C now is, is among injection drug use, and hepatitis C is also a really big concern. Every time I go into a program it, with drugs, a, a methadone program or a substance use treatment program, and I say, I'm here to do my HIV study, they use the CPPR thing to me. They say, no, 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 hepatitis C is what we need to focus on, not HIV. And, and I will say in funding, getting a funded study these days with mono-infected hepatitis C is not easy um, because of just the way funding is handled and, and the HIV dollars are there, the hepatitis C dollars are not. Um, so in terms of uh, the dentist, that was brought up too this morning by Marjorie 
industry. And I, I just wanted to share that dentists, um, I've done a, a number of work, a lot of work with oral health and dentists, um, and I've seen the really positive role. We also see that dentists are one of the most frequent prescribers of uh, prescription opioids. I did a study with Harold Pollack at University of Chicago, and we, sh we are showing um, that, dent that a lot of people who are shopping for drugs, provider shopping, and make their way to the dentist. And uh, this, is, this continues to be a problem and I think a ripe area for uh, intervention. So I did, though I do want to mention the positive thing, I've done studies on dentists and their role in HIV screening and I think in substance use. And I had this talk with uh, Ira Wilson, who's in the back, about providers and all the things that are asked of providers. So I think we have to keep that in mind, too, as we think about innovative ways to work with providers. So just this is another you know, really important uh, pyramid that you probably have all seen that Frieden, uh, Tom Frieden published in AJPH a couple of years ago that really talked about um, the counseling and education being the high agency, smallest impact, whereas if we can intervene at the, at the social context and socioeconomic factors, we can have the largest impact. Um, when I put that for HIV and drug abuse, you know, I think about addressing uh, mass incarceration, housing, poverty, education, um, and some of the things like that, uh, that Angela talked about today about the, the, the lack of access to just healthcare services. And if we can make, if we can have syringe exchange, if we can work in community agencies to try to create one-stop shops and if we can try to work on the laws and, and make na naloxone distributed all over, it's, it's in some places but not always, we can, the more we can work towards the bottom of the pyramid, I think the bigger population impact we will have. Um, counseling and behavioral interventions is another one of the, the negative trial that, um, that, uh, that Rich mentioned but had very important results. We looked at the uh, effect of doing risk reduction counseling at the time of HIV testing in one of my studies, um, and we found that it, it did not have an effect. So in terms of, of, uh, of, of moving forward with HIV testing, I think streamlined HIV testing is, is really the way to go, and then saving resources to focus on counseling when needed, and then also um, trying to take that counseling workforce and focus on probably linkage to care and, and, and follow up for other services, and even most importantly, addressing social determinants of health. Um, not all my studies have been negative. Uh, you know, one, one study that I did in the, in the Clinton Ida Clinical Trials Network, which again shows the social context, showed very importantly that, and this is kind of a very obvious question, but the data had not been, the study had not been done that showed if you put HIV testing in substance use treatment programs and in clinical settings, you're going to get a lot more people tested versus referring them out. And the nice thing about this study was that it has been used by SAMHSA and NIDA and so on to support really encouraging substance use treatment programs to do testing. The flip side to it, though, is that uh, a colleague, Tom Diano, who used to be at Mailman, now at NYU, sh did, has been doing surveys with Pete Friedman and others and, and looking over time at opioid treatments, use of innovative interventions like HIV testing, and they have actually found that programs have been decreasing. So while we came out with this big result that showed, yes, do testing on site, the, the kind of the survey data was showing that pe people are doing it less. So that brings up the issue of implementation science. And I think as we talk about community health, you know, again, just be, and I think you made the, the point this morning, you know, that if just because we test it and we show it doesn't mean that people are going to do it. And, um, and maybe they should and maybe they shouldn't be, but I think we have to focus on that. And that's one of my new studies is, is using a practice coaching intervention as my own work has moved um, from the individual to more of the contextual to, to try to look at um, trying to do a practice coaching to support uh, opioid treatment programs in implementing HIV testing and hepatitis C testing. Um, and then PrEP that we heard this morning from Angela, I just want you know, to say that it, what she said is exactly right, that we have this biomedical intervention. Um, CDC has shown that approximately one-fifth of drug people who inject drugs would be clinically indicated for PrEP, but yet there's really no research and very little studies have been done on PrEP. 
uh, a colleague from, from this town, Rochelle Walensky, uh, who's the new chief of ID now, I think, at Harvard, you know, has questioned, is this the best investment for us in PrEP? You know, in other words, if we have limited investments, is it better for drug users to be investing in medical treatment programs, in medical insurance, in naloxone, in detox, in syringe exchange? Um, and, and, you know, my own feeling about that is, is I think she makes an excellent point, but for those who are high risk, I would want them to have PrEP like anybody else. Why should drug users, you know, not have that? And, and I think the answer is, is partnering with community settings um, to get that done. We have a new study that we're hoping is, is close to being funded that's going to test an integrated model of PrEP and hepatitis C treatment working, as was suggested, with syringe exchange programs, with methadone programs. The programs themselves will try to test an integrated model and we hope we hope to uh, to hope to do this um, my own my own kind of where I am on I, I, I would not consider myself a CBPR researcher I'm not I've never made it to that level but I, I certainly don't do on I think I do with I try to do that but I think we can all work better to uh, to, to, to get us more towards that approach um, just in terms of the end, uh, I just want to say that, again, I think the more we can work towards the, the bottom of the pyramid, the better impact we'll have. I certainly try to be a better person every day to move along that. Um, one of my studies in Puerto Rico, um, we, tr we, we worked for many months in, in the community trying to see what people really needed and what how we could be most helpful by writing a grant, because we had that talent. That's the one thing we were able to offer to Puerto Rico, but we worked worked with the University of Puerto Rico and the health department in a large CBO, community-based organization, and what they told us they wanted was mobile health services and to actually have the services brought into the communities where people are injecting, and this is one of the projects that I'm also doing that I'm very proud of. Um, so the bottom line is I think social context matters. I think from both talks this morning, they talked about like the family suppers that Marjorie does. I, I, I realize I've got to get home tonight to have my family supper with my three kids, I, I think addressing social determinants, I would say place and politics and providers matter and community engagement is essential. And I think we could maybe now invite the other uh, Marjorie and Angela to come back up. And uh, I think we all spoke about uh, lessons learned in different uh, research and we can now uh, have a discussion. Yeah, the idea, Lisa, I think, thank you, Lisa, is, is for you to facilitate this discussion. Um, and I'm going to get off the stage, but um, we'll have three microphones and we can take comments, questions, discussion, however you'd like to lead it. You know, so I, I would like to also want to have everybody to speak here. So maybe I could start off by saying, are there, are there any uh, questions from the audience that people want to bring up? Yes, and, and, and is there a mic back there? Okay, great. Thank you for the question. Um, I, 
I can just start, I, and I just want to add something. As someone who's done a number of randomized trials, one of the criticism I always have is that a lot of times we're testing something and we, have, we don't even know if people want it. I mean, people are randomized to this or this or this, and we don't even, you know, and, and so I, I mean, I was actually very interested in hearing Angela's work, because you're like looking, you know, at prep and trying to understand is this something that people would want and so on, and, and I think Marjorie also, and I think it also speaks to the formative piece. That's, you know, and, and I think sometimes that's not done. When some of us who review grants, you know, we are always looking to see how did we get to this point in developing. But I think a lot more of that is needed. And sometimes for those of us, as, as, and I know for my young faculty, sometimes that's hard to get funded, that earlier piece. Yeah, and I would echo that. And um, just to expand a little bit more, the qualitative piece is so important in figuring out what is it that our populations do need and, and we need to hear what they're thinking about. Because, and I think Angela, you really described that well in, in the process and the work that we've been doing in Idaho too. We can sit in our offices and think about all the things that we think would work well within a community and a population, but A, if we're not members of that community or population, and B, if we don't understand exactly what the needs are, then whatever we develop may not be effective. And so I think one of the things we, we really need to do is be more process oriented, which is very hard in public health research because we're a lot of times about outcomes, right? What is the outcome of the randomized trial? But if we're more process oriented, then we can actually take the time that we need and that's what formative qualitative research can really help us do. So I think it's very tough, but it's something we need to be more invested in. Um, yeah, and I just add that I think um, it's always, you know, when we can afford the time, um, it's always helpful to really um, do multiple stages of formative work. And so um, we didn't, I don't think, had time to talk about it. But I think in developing interventions, um, you know, we can do the sort of preliminary, very preliminary formative work, just finding out if, if something is needed and wanted and, you know, what the acceptability and people's suggestions are. But then we can try to develop something and go through more of an open pilot process to see, you know, kind of, is it, you know, are we thinking along the right lines based on what we heard and um, how can we improve it at that early point um, before we go into sort of a full scale trial of an intervention product that you know we think is good but we don't really know. Um, so I think going through those multiple steps uh, in formative work can be really helpful. Um, and even in, in qualitative research, there are specific methodologies for, for doing that that I think can be helpful, such as member checking. So taking some preliminary conclusions um, and ideas back to the community of participants um, from which they came um, to kind of um, get more feedback on our interpretations as researchers um, to find out if you know how we're interpreting the, the data is actually um, correct in, in their view um, or if we're, we're missing something or if it raises new issues that need to be explored further. Uh, but that's a, a great point. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, uh, Debbie Walker. I, uh, first of all, it's been great, all the presentations. I'm curious about your all's perspective on the following. I think we've seen in moving health of populations, it doesn't take one single intervention. I could tell you that from the tobacco work we did here in Massachusetts. I could tell you that from getting to the best infant mortality rate in Massachusetts. All of you've talked about single interventions because I think that's also where academia is at and random controlled trials. So how do we, in this field, with community health, move the needle to really do multiple component interventions at a time, including social marketing, or we're not gonna get anywhere, we're just on little, so I just be curious, I know why you all have done what you've done and it's excellent, but if we're gonna do population work in public health, we're gonna need to look at much more complex things and acknowledge that. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, and I think it's also not just addressing one issue, but having multiple outcomes, you know, as well. And I, I you know, I think this is exactly where I would want to be. I think the challenge is, and maybe the the government, the the if we have uh, funders in the in the room. I mean, I, that's what I see the challenge. You know, when to do that kind of intervention. I mean, I think even in R01, you know, you're limited by five hundred thousand a year, and when you're 
and, and also to try, you know, if you want to have that external validity to do it in, in, in multiple places. But um, I think that's really what limits. I, I hope if we have, you know, people here, we can really think about, you know, even if it was le I hate to say less grants, but bigger grants that can do uh, bigger things. Yeah, I would agree that, that the limitations are, you know, academia and funding environments are very challenging. And so, you know, when you are given a five-year period with a dollar amount, how do you um, make that a bigger picture and try to work across different disciplines, too? Because I think this could be an interdisciplinary um, a, a, a solution that really could be using an interdisciplinary lens. So. How do you do that when you have one institute focused on one specific outcome and another focused on a specific outcome? So I think you know this is a bigger picture question. You're absolutely right. This is imperative. And yet, in the current state, I don't know how feasible it is. So I think, like you, you were saying, if there are funders in the room or the way funders are thinking about it, I think we need a, a systems approach to the way that funding happens in order to address what, which is an incredibly important issue that you brought up. Um, I'm also glad that Lisa mentioned implementation science um, earlier because I think that's an area where we could possibly take interventions that have worked for one outcome and think about adapting them um, based on the models that they use, uh, the models of delivery, um, the settings. Um, so, you know, I think if, if I think about my own work, I think part of the reason why syringe exchange programs have been so effective in, in distributing um, clean syringes where they exist is that they are kind of based in the community and that's a model that seems to work for the population that they're serving. So if we can think about um, other things to deliver through those, those systems where they exist, of course it's not perfect, but um, so I think thinking about how we actually deliver um, things that work can be one, one way to try to expand our thinking a little bit. And I'll add to that too, it, in thinking about the way that even the NIH now requests um, proposals around innovation, how innovation is, is its own category. And so we're constantly being asked to be innovative and innovation is really, we have to do these one-off studies in a way and, and that's how we build them up. So what you were saying about adapting current interventions that are evidence-based that we know work in maybe one population or one um, health behavior could be relatable to others, but if we're always thinking we have to be innovative, we have to be innovative, that might actually stifle that process. So again, this is a, a bigger picture, a more holistic approach, thinking about how can we actually do this in, in a way that could be effective over the long term. Uh, I just have a question. I'm curious of your response to low agency interventions. When I look at what you did you know, with supper, I mean, that's something that you know, people if having dinner it could be like a low agency. I mean, wh what is your kind of low agency versus high agency? Um, okay. So I think, you know, I, I think a lot about what are things that are happen that people are already engaging in that we could maybe make them a little bit better or help direct people like family dinners, right? Now, again, family dinners in and of themselves may be a terrible thing, depending on the context. If you have an abusive family or, or an environment that's contentious, that, that in and of itself isn't good. So how, or I, I also have a study, a qualitative study that um, I did around family meals and parents and children and talked to them about what is it about meals that might be you know, important for them. And I had a parent in my study who said, I eat family meals seven days a week with my daughter, it was just the two of them, and I like them to be silent because I am always, I'm working all day, I'm talking to people all day for my job, and when I get home, I just want them to be completely silent. And so if the whole point of meals, if the mechanism by which family meals works, or dinners work, is communication, then we need to do a better job at these low level interventions of just sort of making them you know, something that might actually be effective. But the, I think low-hanging fruit in a way or low-level, low-agency interventions have an incredibly important place because there's something, if we're, people are already engaging in them or something we can ask people to engage in um, without asking them to give up too much or to do too much, like asking people to take a pill every day is, is a big deal. But maybe if they're already doing something, um, it, it presents an opportunity. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you to our panel. Let's give them a round of applause.
Okay, this is your break. You have 12, not 15 minutes. Please be back at 11.30 for our keynote speaker, who will start at 11.30. We'll be right on track for lunch. Thanks very much.